Okay. Okay, so say, I say a few words of presentation and uh, actually there, there is no good reason to be very formal, but still. So I'm honored to open CSOC's second annual public event. Um, and this time it's sponsored with, in conjunction with the Department of Jewish History and the Department of Jewish Thought at Ben Gurion University of the Negev. In dialogue with the center's theme of 2021-2, rethinking center and periphery in the Abrahamic religions, and with reference to this specific time of the Jewish annual cycle or the Israeli annual cycle, between the commemoration of the Exodus from Egypt, the Holocaust Memorial Day and the Israeli Day of Independence, we've invited you, Frederick Brenner, to share your thought-provoking work and reflections with us. Frederick Brenner received his MA degree in social anthropology from the Sorbonne. He's a world-renowned photographer who presented his work in museums and galleries around the world, published five books and directed three films. His landmark project, Diaspora, Homelands in Exile, was exhibited in nine different cities and was published in several editions, some of which you can see at the National Library we just mentioned. It is a striking photographic record of a 25 years long search for Jewish life in 40 countries over five continents. It captures the diversity of Jewish life, challenges the notion of unity of the Jewish people, and questions the possibility of defining a center, geographical, cultural, or spiritual, for Jewish communities today. Before I ask Frederick to share his presentation, I would like to thank him for coming. Thank Raya, Evan David for organizing. Someone should... Uh, Asha, can you... Wait. Oh. Yeah, okay. Please, please mute yourself. Ken Ken, on your side, they have a... Okay, right. So I'd like to thank Raya for organizing this. I'd like to thank professors Kana Verman and Oded Israeli for co-sponsoring. And I will seize the opportunity to invite the guests I see here who are unfamiliar with our center to look up our face Facebook and to join us again on one of our lectures, conferences, or book events. So, Frederick, please, you are welcome to begin. Should I share the screen? Yes, please. Okay. Right. Thank you, Raya, and thank you, Daniela. I believe we will be able to now. Uh, the technology will not uh, uh, will not be a problem. Yes, thank you for your introduction and thank you for for inviting me for your annual lecture. I hope it will be as thought provoking as uh, you mentioned. Uh, and what I really hope is that uh, this will, these photographs and uh, my, my introduction and the kind of conclusion, which is more an opening, uh, and looking at the photograph, uh, will be uh, a pretext for a conversation. When maybe we can go back to the first, uh, to the first slide, where there's a title, and then when I will... Uh, No, backward. Yes, thank you very much. When the visible is being fetishized and the invisible sacrificed, the world certainly doesn't need any more images and less photographs can challenge our views, open a crack in what we think we know. If our knowledge, what we think we know, has led us to this overburdened world on the brink of catastrophe, how do we stay clear-sighted, clear-hearted, clear-headed, and most of all, clear-hearted? In the midst of such confusion, what can I contribute as a photographer? At each step of my journey, I have tried to formulate the stakes at the ver very core of my endeavor. I have an again and again revisited my intentions, 
in light of the outcome. There were always more questions than answers. Now, at this phase of my quest, I'm thinking about the architecture of my work as a whole, how to stage this photographic harvest so that it conveys the main vectors which guided me and the even more important one which were revealed to me in the process. Because ultimately, this photographic harvest must become an archive at the National Library to be mined now and in the future so that viewer can, viewers can drive to the heart of every answer and expose the question the answer hides, to quote James Baldwin. I now see clearly that the overall arch of my work is an invitation to embrace otherness. If I started with an intuition and an inner call that led me on a 40-year journey to over 45 countries, I have to admit that it was largely a subconscious drive. In fact, this journey undertook me rather than I undertook it. As the contour of the portrait I was drawing started to emerge, it became more and more obvious that my initial intention to create a visual record of the Jewish people in modern times led me to address questions about the human condition. It simultaneously morphed into an auto-portrait reflecting all the rifts and paradoxes of my human condition. From Samarkand to Calcutta, Sarajevo to Beijing, Tangier to Rome, and from New York to Berlin, the further I went, the closer I was getting to myself. A journey of restitution to a history, my history, unspoken, buried, dissimulated, forgotten, overcome, in order to finally embrace my own path, a path that lead to intimacy, to know thyself. And photographic practice ex exposed me to, to intimacy. In the words of the iconic American photographer, Edward Weston, what could be more intimate than the close-up study of an object or being in absolute accord with someone's emotion when working on a portrait. Driven to save from her oblivion visual fragments of a history, both one and plural, almost addicted to documenting every possible sample of Jewish acculturation and survival everywhere on the planet, this photographic, ethnographic, sociologic, and historic survey became the prologue to a journey of self-discovery. With my camera as a tool, I have been retrieving the many threads which weave the complexity of who I am, rescuing many of my ignored, despised, abandoned selves. The original outward movement to portray the fragments of a large jigsaw puzzle led me to the discovery of an emotional geography to an inward movement from macrocosm to microcosm and back again, from the particular to the universal and back again. As I, was my, as I was mapping the diaspora of my people, it became clear that this journey of self-exploration through diaspora was in fact a journey of exploration of the diaspora within, an inner geography of my many selves. Each one is various, many, an overflow of selves in the outstretched colony of our being. All kinds of people exist who think and feel in various ways, say the poet Fernando Pessoa. Today, revisiting the titles I choose for my books, I see an itinerary of restitution. So the first one, Instance of Eternity, I see myself my young self with a romantic longing for harmony and shlemut, unaware of the real life of the people I was photographing and equally unaware of what was going on inside myself. This is the first series of photographs you will see. It's a monograph on Mea Shearim where I spent more or less three years in between 1979 and 1982. 
Diaspora, homelands in exile. My big book starting to question what is home and what is exile. And then exile at home, while acknowledging fault lines and scars in the human landscape. The work started, the work started to mirror one of the most conflicted times in my life. Then an archaeology of fear and desire, the book I published about eight years ago. Yes, an archaeology of my fear and my desire as reflected in the intensity and paradoxes of Israel today. And my most recent book, Tzer Heilt, or Healed to Pieces, a word invented by Paul Celan, which deals with fragmentation, disintegration, and longing to be healed. It takes place in Berlin today. And as I have tried to, to make sense of this phase of my journey for this, for this lecture and for myself, I have not found anything better than the word of the Sufi poet from the 13th century, Jalal al-Din Mohammed Rumi, who says, don't turn your head, look at the bandage place. This is where the light enters you. And don't think for a moment that you are healing yourself. Most people know this quote and think it's Leonard Cohen, but this is Rumi who first, you know, wrote those verse, you know, about uh, eight, eight centuries ago. By trying, to, by trying to connect dots, the dots now seem to be connecting me. In fact, they have been connecting me since the very beginning. All along, since the beginning of my journey, the injunction to Abraham resonates. Lech lecha. Lech lecha mi artsecha, mi molatecha, mi betaivicha. Go forth, leave your land, your kindred, the house of your father. If the public tonight is uh, just Israeli, I don't need to translate that. And go to the place I will give you to see. And the place is never named as if it belonged to each of us to name it as we are going there. Lech lecha, go for you, go to yourself, go with yourself, go within yourself. The, the land I will give you to see. The land is about an inner space, an inner place, not only a territory. It's about another field of consciousness, which has to be stretched and experience in order to acknowledge, to accept, and to embrace. And as I wrestled for years before I dared to embrace, to embrace the non-familiar, the unknown, the strange and the stranger, the stranger within, to dare to be a strange rather than hold on to fictions, narratives that we have carved to bridge the unbearable, dissonant, ever-changing reality inside, outside the fragments which can never reconcile. This is what my photographic practice has led me to. We need to recognize that we are multiple within ourselves, strangers even to ourselves. This is the ultimate promise and the only possible redemption. There's no redemption other than embracing our own plurality the selves that may be hostile, contradictory, exclusive, strong, vulnerable, enigmatic, and mysterious. Montaigne, the great French essayist, who himself lived through a plague in the 16th century, said, we are all lumps, so various and shapeless in texture that every piece plays at every moment its own game, and there is as much difference between us and ourselves, as between us and the other. If this journey had not led me closer to myself, to more intimacy with the unknown, with my difference, with my fears, to the point of embracing otherness, this journey would have been in vain. It was out of a deep necessity that I couldn't name then, but that I couldn't renounce it either, that I answered this mysterious inner call and went everywhere on the planet to create a portrait of my people. I had, navi I have, I had a naive loving notion of the Jewish people and longed to show its unity and wholeness, 
but the more I was looking, searching for a common thread, the more I was forced to recognize the discontinuity among the vast spectrum of expressions of Jews and Judaism. What do all these people have in common but their differences? If I hadn't been a photographer, I may never have started to question the intricacies of identity. I was prompted to do so because as a portraitist, I had to explore how to represent a human being, to deconstruct the image of the Jew in what began to appear to me as the performance of identity. For decades and at each stage of my journey, I've been wrestling with questions regarding the photographic form, which could reveal the large typology of acculturations, plural, I encountered. The challenge was to reinvent a form appropriate to the specificity of each community, scattered as they were on the entire spectrum of time and space over four continents, from tribal, tribal to postmodern, from medieval to industrial, still coexisting in contemporary time, a rare opportunity. While I was originally motivated to save from oblivion antique forms of acculturation on the verge of extinction in Morocco, India, Yemen, and Central Asia, among many other countries, these oriental forms of acculturation were easily identifiable visually. But as the puzzle was taking shape in front of my eyes, my interest, moved, my interest moved to West, to the West, America and Europe, where the increasing fluidity and fragmentation of the ethno-racial landscape and the proliferation of crossover forms of racial, gender, and religious identification obliged me to think in a broader and eventually more fruitful way about the complexities tensions and contradictions in the contemporary politics of identity. The expanding empire of choice in identity has provoked anxieties about destabilization of the cognitive, social, and moral order. In a time of unsettled identities, an opportunity is offered to us to look at identity for what they are, fictions, identities, seem to us real because they have been hammered long enough that we think they are solid and unquestionable. It is only now in my most recent work that I'm confronting the opportunity this offers me as a Jew and as a human being. The collapsing and blurring of all categories is an invitation to revisit and question culturally consecrated constructs to which we have been holding on and which we have and which have been holding on to us and to free ourselves. Even though Pesach is behind us, <laughs> the work starts. Uh, so now maybe we, we go to the, it's time to look at the photographs. Uh, and uh, I will, because, uh, because of my, uh, of my te technological handicap, I will do this on the side of the, uh, of the screen, so uh, Daniela will be kind enough to uh, to move the photograph. So we are here in Jerusalem, and it's in fact everything started in Jerusalem. Hilda. Sorry. Hi. What? You finished babysitting? <laughs> this is brilliant. I mean, I've seen some most incredible things on Zoom, but yeah. I would like, yes. <laughs> okay. So maybe this guy can yeah. mute himself. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Great. See you. Bye. So the babysitting is taking care, taken care of. Let's continue. So we are here, in fact, in Mea Shehahim, where everything started for me. I was 18. I had never been in Israel before. And I had, I had never felt a special attraction for photography either, but I was truly enchanted in the etymological sense of the word by Jerusalem and the neighborhood of Mea Shehahim, by this timeless choreography in this little enclave, this shtetl in the heart of the Middle East, in fact, diaspora 
in the heart of, the, of Jerusalem. Jacques Derrida, who wrote a series of texts for my book, Diaspora, uh, write that this photograph say that Meash Karim is the key of diaspora. It remains outside home, at home. And this became in fact the matrix of my entire project, which then led me to over 45 countries. And this is my very first photograph, Purim in Jerusalem. Sukkot, we could very well be in Poland or somewhere in Eastern Europe 100 years ago. We are very far from Jerusalem. We are in fact in Birobidjan, in the far east of the former Soviet Union. To give you an idea, nine hours flight from Moscow and one hour from Tokyo, we are in what became the Jewish autonomous region of the Soviet Union. It was supposed to become a republic. Uh, it remained a Jewish autonomous region. It was an idea of Stalin, where Jews from around the world, not only from Russia and other republic, but also from Argentina, France, America, came to settle and create a Jewish state about 20 years before the creation of the state of Israel. Here in the middle of the taiga, at the border of China, uh, below 40 centigrade in winter and plus 40 for summer. I think Jews have never, have never been afraid of such experiments in Utopia. And doesn't such inclination in fact define who we are? We are in Ilinka in Russia, in a restricted area, it took me quite a number of years to be able to get a permission. Uh, it's, uh, we are in a kolkhoz, a collective farm, the place where in fact Nathan Sharansky, I was with him two weeks ago, and this is the very place where he was arrested while encouraging those Subutnik Gerim to emigrate to Israel. Uh, Subutnik Gerim in fact were in the medieval period Orthodox Christians who were Judaizing within the, the Orthodox Church, and uh, they eventually converted to Judaism, and most of them were basically killed, and few groups, few survive, and they, they basically, you find one group in Russia, one, one group in the Caucasus, uh, and one group in Siberia. Uh, this family, like most other families from these small uh, kolkhoz, immigrated to Israel a few years later, and they today live in Bet Shemesh. So for people who are involved with uh, ethnography or urban ethnography, this is a wonderful, uh, <laughs> a wonderful project. And I like this photograph because it seems uh, we are here out of a Dostoevsky novel, and the portrait above the bed really looks like an icon. So this capacity of taking the shape and the color of the place where we live is basically what we did for 2000 years. We are, we are in Bukhara, uh, in Central Asia, and this is the night of Oshana Rabbah in the synagogue. I went for the first time to, the, to, to former Soviet Union in 1982 under Andropov, and when the Perestroika started, I was on one of the very first Western photographers to be granted the permission to travel in the 15 republics of the Soviet Union. We had such a monolithic perception, even today, of what was Soviet Union. And I wanted to show the extraordinary ethnic and cultural diversity within this vast territory, and equally among Jews. The Jews are just a symptom of the place where they live. Uh, to summarize, they, are, they, were, they were, they are still four main district Jewish communities uh, and Jews were able to retain their specific identity in the republics where Islam was prevailing, uh, Central Asia and the Caucasus, uh, because the central government was always afraid of the potential 
uh, rise of, of fundamentalism. Um, and uh, yes, we are in Cuba, uh, more exactly in Krasnaya Sloboda, uh, in uh, the Caucasus along the Caspian Sea, uh, about 200 kilometers from, uh, from Baku. And uh, in fact, uh, and this is one of the four group, mountain Jews, Gorski Evry, uh, and we are in a chai khana, a tea room. And tea is a religion in Azerbaijan and in Central Asia equally. In fact, this very place was called the Jerusalem of the Caucasus with 18 synagogues before the war. And apart from scholar, we hardly know anything about this Jewish community who survived on the margin of our memory, uh, on the margin of history. In the 80s, you had about 200,000 Jews who lived between Baku and Machachkala uh, up north, so between Baku and Machachkala along the Caspian Sea. And these, these communities preserved, you know, created uh, poetry, music, theater, they had their own Judeo-Persian language called Pat. Uh, and I wanted to put a face of the, on this way of remaining a Jew, of remaining a man, a woman under so many skies. We are in Leninabad uh, in Tajikistan, uh, not far from uh, the Afghan border. Uh, we are in a Jewish hairdresser saloon. All barbers are Jews, all customers are Muslim Tajiks. And when Mark Twain say Jews are just like everybody else, only more so, this is what this photograph is about. And this is what the entire project is about, in fact. We are in Ethiopia, more exactly in the Simian Mountains, close to Eritrea. Uh, I went there three times. I went uh, during these periods where Mengitsu was ruling. And I wanted to go there because it is the only community we know which had uh, retained pre-Talmudic practices which had disappeared from all other uh, Jewish communities. Uh, and uh, this, what is amazing is that the people you see today are all contemporary. So it's a window of 25 years, 30 years, because in fact, you know, I've been working for 40 years on various communities. When I created my book, uh, Diaspora Homelands in Exile, it was 25 years. But ever since I've continued to gather, to piece together this puzzle. Um, we are perfectly coordinating, Daniela. So we are here in Haidan, Yemen, uh, in 1983. <laughs> so this is Lewi Faez with his grandfather studying in his jewelry workshop. And uh, in fact, uh, we can maybe look at the next photograph. This is the same Lewi Faez uh, who got married. He's here 16 and Nathara is 14. They were married. He was 12 and she was 10. Nothing strange, you know, in uh, Arab countries, at least uh, maybe not anymore in Morocco and Tunisia because of the French mandate, uh, but in countries like Yemen, yes. And uh, uh, this is in their, the Merkaskita when uh, Lewi just arrived from Yemen and uh, with Nadra, and uh, Mazal is sitting on the laps of his, uh, of her father. They, I mean, I, what you see here, you know, from the beginning is in a way my family imaginaire. So you have here, I am still in touch with Lewi. I spoke with him just before Pesach and uh, Nadra got married. I was at the wedding. Yeah. Nadra. It wasn't very much. Sorry? We were walking it all over. 
Nadra uh, got a son. I was at the Brit Mila. And four years ago, I attended a seder with five generations. Uh, next photograph. We are at the border of Saudi Arabia, still in Yemen. And for me, diaspora started to appear as a metaphor for fertilizing, how we have been fertilized and how we have fertilized in return. Is this dress made for the architecture or the architecture for the dress? Uh, next photograph. We are in Calcutta. Uh, in India, the home of Moses Elias, sitting with his servant, one of the few survivors of these thriving communities of Jews, mainly merchants from Baghdad and Basra, who settled in India, uh, in Burma, and in Singapore in the second half of the 19th century, and then immigrated to England, Israel, and the US after the independence of India. So my project, in fact, is very much like a game of matryoshkas, you know, those Russian dolls, one in the other, endlessly. And, uh, but now we are in, in India, but Baghdadi Jews came in the mid 19th century, so quite late, while you had another community, an indigenous, two other indigenous community. I'm sure everybody has heard of the Jews of Cochin, but there were hardly any Jews left in Cochin in the 80s. And uh, we are here in the next photograph in Alibag in India. Uh, and so among the indigenous community of Bene Israel living on the coast of Mumbai, two hours from Mumbai. Uh, and the Jews there were known as a caste. Uh, a caste within a system of caste, and a caste of oil press men, and their name was Shanwar Teli, which means in, the, in, the, in Marathi, in the dialect of the Maharashtra, the oil press man who doesn't work on Shabbat. So Shabbat uh, became the signifier of their name. And we are here in front of the synagogue, and if you could see more uh, you know, if you would get close, you could see written both in Hebrew, in Marathi, uh, and in English. We are quite far from uh, Alibag. Uh, we are in Belmonte, Portugal, the last existing group then in the, in the early 80s of secret Jews or crypto Jews or known more as Maranos. Uh, officially, they were, this is a community of 120 people who were officially baptized, married, and buried by the priest. But these 120 people had preserved a double set of practices. Uh, so, but in order to fool the Inquisition, they had postponed uh, uh, Pesach, at the time of Pesach Sheni, many people came to know of the existence of Pesach Sheni re in recent time because of the pandemic. Uh, so if for some reason of impurity, one couldn't, uh, or other reason, one couldn't celebrate Pesach at the time of Pesach, he could, pause, he, could uh, he or she could practice it a month later. And the way they had postponed it, you know, despite the condition, uh, despite the, inqui the inquisition, which was only abolished in 1835, uh, they were able to reprogram themselves for four centuries. And they never confused the identity which belonged to them to the identity that they had borrowed in order to hide their identity. So this is an incredible example. I think never like during this moment. So we are under the attic with Emilia uh, Diogo Enriquez and her family uh, who had the courage to accept that we would go under the attic to celebrate with them the Santa Festa, the Pesach. And never did I feel like myself 
going out of Egypt. And they don't have any books, but by heart, they will, they will recitate, they will just read the Agadah, which is in its essence, almost like at our, as our Agadah. The tradition is kept by the women and their seder consists in baking the matzot on those tiles that you see in the middle of the room. Uh, and uh, yes, yeah, a very moving experience. And I made a film that can be seen on YouTube 30 years ago called The Last Maranos, where you really see, I mean, practices which generation of historians, you know, from Cecil Rhodes and others had dreamt to put a face on that. And in 1992, uh, I published a book with Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi. Yosef wrote a beautiful 70 pages essay on uh, for, for this book that I published. We are, uh, we are in Chateau Rabat in Bordeaux. Very interesting story because those were former Maranos from Portugal who escaped to France uh, and were known as Portuguese which was synonymous of Jewish. Basically what you called la nation portugaise dans le sud-ouest de la France is exactly that. And Montaigne's mother was a, a, a Jewish woman who left Portugal and found, found refuge in Bordeaux. Uh, and this photograph illustrates perfectly well the process of acculturation. Again, how we take the color and the, and the shape of the place where we go. And the story of this photograph is incredible, but we are limited in time. So uh, we are in Manaus, Brazil, uh, the Benchimol family at the opera. Uh, Jews at the time of the rubber boom in uh, the 1860s uh, decided to go from Morocco, from Rabat uh, mainly, but other places up to uh, Belém on the coast you know, of Brazil and all along the, the Amazon River up until Iquitos, the Peruvian border, you still find today residual of what were Jewish communities, but Manaus had a big Jewish community. And the famous opera of Manaus. Salonika, Greece, uh, as you know, 93% of the community, the Sephardic community was deported and killed uh, in Auschwitz. We are in Rome, in the Campidoglio, in the city hall with Robert, Roberto Di Segni, a Jewish peddler that I met on the market while I spent a year at the French Academy, the Villa Medici. Uh, and for me, the question is how such a handful of Jews were able to survive for 2000 years at the heart of Christianity. In fact, in, in the very place where Christianism was manufactured and exported. And uh, here on the photograph, uh, um, you can almost see the hammer which carved the face of Roberto Di Segni. And uh, there's the, all, the, all, all the César are here. Titus, Adrien, Alexandre Sever, they are all here. So we are not uh, in Egypt, we are in Las Vegas, the Hebrew Academy. <laughs> the Jewish Day School of Las Vegas. Again, it speaks about our inclination for dreaming. Uh, Yaakov, Yosef, Boxy Siegel today, uh, and it continues. We are in Billings, Montana. Uh, there's there was about 40 Jewish families uh, in Billings, Montana, and uh, there was an anti-Semite act in, uh, in 1992. And following this, uh, this anti-Semite act, um, the, the sheriff put a full page ad in the newspaper of Montana 
asking the entire population to display a Hanukkah in their window. And the entire town uh, basically uh, put, it, put these full page ads with the Hanukkah uh, in their window. And I thought, you know, it took me about six months to think, how can I show this incredible movement? Simon Shama wrote an essay for this book that I published on America, say that it's a reverse pogrom. It's, a, it's basically a photograph about Jews without a single Jew. And you have everybody from the people who are still called today mud race, the Native Americans, that you, you can see one in the front and you can see the man uh, um, just in the center behind the sheriff. And, and the entire town is basically came for this photograph. I mean, it's a long, it's a big production, as you can imagine, or maybe you cannot even imagine, but... Uh, We are in the Kodesh Akdoshim of the Freudians, uh, 14 of the most famous New York psychoanalysts in the Holy of Holy of the, the New York Psychoanalytical Society, with uh, Freud the father everywhere. Just on the left, you can see Charcot. Um, we are uh, on Ellis Island, uh, and you have here about about 40 iconic figures who really shaped American culture and white Western culture in the second half of the 20th century. Uh, you know, you can recognize maybe Estee Lauder, Dustin Hoffman, Henry Kissinger, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Steven Spielberg, uh, Philip Roth, Lauren Bacall, Dr. Ruth, Billy Wilder, etc. And uh, so, I mean, I met with each of them personally. And, uh, and then I made a portrait and then I brought all these portraits on Ellis Island the day where the book was published. They all came on Ellis Island uh, for a big celebration. Uh, and for me, again, it's always the same. What do all these people have in common but their differences and the way they relate to their difference uh, and what they, choose, what they choose in fact to do with it? We are in Johannesburg, uh, and this photograph is, to, is called Let Me Teach Your May Jewish Cooking, called Brenda. Reality or fiction? In fact, most of my photographs play on this very thin line. Uh, but what is amazing here is why didn't the taxidermist ask me why a Jewish cooking class in my facility? And why didn't Brenda ask me why a Jewish cooking class at the taxidermist of all places? I mean, we could spend a lot of time talking about this photograph, which is in a way why this photograph, uh, uh, why I created this photograph. We are in Buenos Aires, uh, Argentina, Matilda Melibovsky, one of the many mothers uh, of missing those madres de desaparecidos uh, who lost she uh, lost her daughter who was tortured and murdered under the military dictature between 1976 and 1984 as two about 2,000 other uh, Jewish teenagers and young adults who had the same fate under the dictature a totally disproportionate number compared to the number of Jews in Argentina. We are on the Great Wall of China. Those are members of the Jewish community of Beijing and Hong Kong. And some people, last week, somebody, I gave a lecture two weeks ago, and somebody from Singapore said, oh, we came also for this uh, occasion. Uh, while nations define themselves by and through a territory, and if there's a territory, then you have to protect it. And then this wall run on 3,000 miles. But I believe there's a people whose text is their first and more foremost territory, uh, which, have enabled, which have enabled us to survive for 2,000 years in diaspora with this portable identity. 
uh, and here is the little, you know, portable uh, altar with a Sefer Torah in it. This was the result of, uh, you know, six months studying uh, Megillat Esther with uh, the entire community. But for me, what this photograph address is the following question. Aren't we all protecting territories which do not exist? I'm trying to give you a glimpse into, you know, 40 years of work. So the following photographs are part of a project called This Place, Makomze, uh, that I initiated in 2008, in which I invited 11 other artists to join me in exploring Israel and the West Bank as place and metaphor, an attempt to look beyond the headlines, deep into the fault lines, to look beyond a dual perspective for against victim perpetrator through a poetic approach. And if I had originally planned to photograph it myself while carving uh, the working hypothesis, it became very clear quickly that Israel is a place of radical otherness and a place of radical dissonance. And if so, I should then invite others in order to question this otherness. And this is what I did. So my own contribution to this place is called An Archaeology of Fear and Desire. The exhibition which took place at the Tel Aviv Museum, maybe some of you saw it. Uh, so I needed to go back to Jerusalem where I started, you remember the first photographs with the angel and the photograph uh, you saw Sukkot could be 100 years ago. And uh, so to undertake this time, an archaeology of my, my own archaeology, an archaeology of my many selves. And as a good archaeologist, uh, I needed a working hypothesis in front of this dig. And at the core of my working hypothesis, there's a promise, a promise attached to this land from immemorial time for all its inhabitants. And the question I had uh, that I ask myself is, what have we done with this promise? What can we do with it? And what can it do with us? And now let's look at the few photographs from this, uh, from this photographic essay. This is the former Palace Hotel, today transformed as the Waldorf Astoria. And in a way, this photograph is the key to unlock all the other photographs. I never photographed architecture before. And uh, so we can go to the next photograph. The Weinfeld family, uh, just before Shabbat at their home. And for me, it is in a way the dream already dreamt. My eldest daughter, Elior, who uh, spent three years in Oketz. Near, injured by an exploding mine during the Lebanon war. Fatito and his wife and his children in uh, Midbar Yehuda. You know, uh, yes, sometimes people read our text as a book of geography. Uh, I believe it's, it, it should reflect to an inner geography, but, uh, but it's an amazing moment where, you know, those hills must have been almost the same, you know, 2000 years ago. Avi Aslan and his family, he turns to be my neighbor and I see him going, you know, every, uh, every Shabbat to the beach, you know, somewhere in, uh, I live in Jerusalem when I'm in Israel. So, and uh, on, the, on, uh, on the coastal dunes, there are very few, I passed by my, with my car the other day, <laughs> those dunes don't exist anymore. And, uh, but this photograph is in a way, of course, I wanted to photograph uh, Edota Mizrah in a big way, 
to try to reverse what has been done in the past. Um, but this is my waiting for Godot. Uh, we are in uh, in Jerusalem, uh, Pnina Leonov, her mother and her daughter, three generations of German Jews, they arrived in 19th, uh, the grandmother arrived in 1930 and still live in Maria. Ben Gurion Airport, three Hasidim practicing Shmirat Enaim. <laughs> Uh, and who told me when I met with one guy, it took me four years to, to succeed to make this photograph with their collaboration. <laughs> kibbutz Magan Michael, I thought even though the kibbutz is uh, only a shadow of what it used to be, but uh, I thought it was important to still have uh, something of the kibbutz in a photographic essay. Um, and um, so my assistant is from Magan Michael. So he connected me with uh, some of his friends. And uh, very quickly, I understood that uh, what I was, what I wanted to do uh, uh, would have to deal with Bate Yeladim. And uh, so I decided to create uh, and they are the last promotion of uh, then children who went through Bate Yeladim, after which it was abolished. And so those four, 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 those four women, uh, after six months of conversation, me alone with each of them, and then together, we decided to create this photograph. And this photograph was supposed to be about uh, showing how uh, they have been what they consider to be korbanot on the altar of Zionist ideology. But the beauty of photography is that, you know, there's always something which erupts that you cannot plan. You need to plan everything you can plan, but then you always need to leave some space for something to erupt. And while they experience their life as korbanot and while it has been very difficult for each of them to get married, to have children, that uh, they look like incredible plants. Look, I mean, look how rooted they are, and that, and and it's uh, and they were both. We were both surprised, and uh, you know, we decided after six months of long conversation, we spent a day together. And this photograph was not planned at all. We have several other versions in different different other settings. So. Yes, my work is very collaborative. Uh, and the more I go, the more, the more it's the, the people are basically staging themselves. Um, so for Israelis, this is not a strange photograph. Uh, this is uh, Ayalon uh, on Yom HaShoah. The next slide is basically my last project, uh, which was just a big exhibition finished in Berlin. And uh, if you, it was originally called Spectres of Memory, the performance of Jewishness, a Berlin diary. And then it became Seheilt, this word created by Paul Celan, uh, which again means, uh, uh, and he, this is part of his, uh, in his uh, correspondence with his lover, Ilana Shmueli, he writes, Sie haben mich zerheilt. They have healed me to pieces. So I won't show you any, for, I will show you one photograph of this photographic essay, which was published and uh, uh, exhibited and uh, yes, Daniela. So this is the the first photograph I took in Berlin, and uh, in the book that was published and in the exhibition, there's no captions. 
no, I didn't want to provide any crutches for the viewer in order to enable the viewer to experience the void, to enable the viewer to lean on the void, to, to enable the viewer to basically be estranged. And what happened when we feel estranged, when we don't have any, because the caption wouldn't add anything to, to this photograph. The only thing I can tell you tonight, because I'm here for, you know, to, to show the work of that, what is the most amazing, I didn't do anything. This photograph really took me. I, uh, I was a fellow at the Wissenschaft College in Berlin. I was invited for a year and he was a, um, a fellow like me. And we used to go swimming together. And, uh, and I told him when we, you know, we were just changing in the room, say, Carrie, what is this? Say, this is the Incipit. This is the first page of uh, Minima Moralia, the masterpiece of uh, Adorno uh, on his back. So if you want to know more, we can meet or... Uh, and then the last photograph, which really answers so much, this one. This was my first photograph. And the last one is, I mean, and the photograph you saw before is my last photograph. So two different angels. So we are, you know, we are done for the photograph. And uh, so here I am 40 years later, uh, having gathered my fragments. We can remain on the last image if you want to, Daniela, or if it's too late, then uh, that's okay. Uh, no, no. So I think I it's you... it's better. We have we we see each, we see each other now, and it would be okay. great. People who have uh, were sitting behind black windows will um, emerge. Okay, fine, fine. But I just want to con to conclude and then to uh, open. To, oh, okay. Uh, would you like me to go back to the last image? That's okay. You can you can stay on that if you want, uh, like that. Uh, okay. So uh, yes, forty years later. Uh, I find myself having gathered my fragments. Uh, you have seen today about 40 images out of 150,000 images, uh, revisiting my journey again and again in conversation with the fragments, not looking for coherence, uh, not trying to create coherence, more at peace because more intimate with the strange and the stranger and simultaneously more strange from what then felt more familiar. Isn't it, star, isn't it time to start dealing with our fragments, to listen to the polyphony within, to dare to deal with dissonance and this overflow of self, to embrace the ever-changing reality inside, outside, to embrace the core law of the universe, to embrace impermanence, in other words, and therefore difference, our own difference, the difference between us and ourselves. What do I have in common with the Jews? I hardly have anything in common with myself, say Kafka in his diary in 1904. It was our, uh, one cannot live without narratives, without representations, and constant, but one has the obligation not to mistake them for what they are not. They are levers and tools to access our humanity, to reflect and spread it in the world. Otherwise, we end up prostrating ourselves in front of fictions which take the place of the invisible out of which the visible is woven. We cannot, we must not let our narratives become straight jackets with which suffocate us. We cannot accept to shrink because when we shrink ourselves, we necessarily shrink. We end up shrinking others, excluding and eventually sacrificing the other. Identity is this in between a permanent becoming, not solid, but always in flux, always reconfiguring. Quite unsettling, of course. Nothing to hold on to just the void to lead on, but so profoundly human. This is what my photographic journey 
has taught me to pursue a conversation between strangeness and intimacy, to become, as the photographer, an intimate stranger. Today, I would like to share with you what I consider the blessing of this journey of self-exploration. The truth is that after sought and hesitation, I welcome the National Library invitation to place my archive at the library in Jerusalem. After all, it is the repository of the collective memory of the Jewish people. And I see this as an opportunity for me to try and articulate what has been incubating for a long time. What architecture, what architecture shall I give to this photographic harvest, this puzzle, so that the viewer can embrace otherness and with that walk on his or her own path. Even as I was creating my work, I asked myself, how, to, how do I have enough, how do I leave enough space for the viewer to find his own way, in essence, so that these representations continue to watch over absence? The pandemic which has shaken us uh, to the very foundation of our certitudes obliges us, whether we want it or not, to revisit what, we has, what has led us to the age of this abyss. What is it, what is in, needed, in fact, is, a, is an awakening of the heart. The mind alone cannot cope. The crisis we are facing results from the erosion of otherness, both in the landscape, in the form of the disappearance of biodiversity, as well, in the, as, well as in the human landscape, where pluralism is smothered in favor of ideolo ideological conformity. May we create the conditions that will change our pace so that our hearts can open. May we patiently explore and embrace the nothingness and the void, the shadow and the invisible. How else shall we, shall we defy gravity and give grace a chance to permeate us? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I found each and every uh, photograph uh, deeply moving, um, but I'll, I'll I'll give a chance uh, for for all the all present to respond. Uh, questions, remarks. Davidi, would you like to say something? Yeah, I, I think the thought was first, but... No, no. You will we'll be. have time for everybody. Okay. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, okay, hour. so go ahead. Go, okay. go the ahead. Night is, the night is young. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for this marvelous and, and spectacular uh, photos from, from different places. It was really, really interesting. Um, yeah, however, I... I it's not, it's not a question more than a remark or, or an invitation for, for discussion later. The, the photos of the Jews in the, we could call it the diaspora, not in the state of Israel, shows a picture of, pictures of Jews that are practicing Judaism, Passover or Shoshana Rabba or Sukkot, even the ultra-Orthodox Jews in Israel that doesn't see themselves as part of the state of practicing Judaism. Uh, however, the pictures that you showed in the end of, from Israel, there are pictures of Jews that are practicing Israelism, uh, and not only Judaism. Uh, your daughter with, uh, with the, from the army, which, uh, by the way, I, I served with her in Hebron about 15 years ago, is funny, um, but uh, it's, it was interesting to see how in the diaspora, uh, uh, Jew has to, to practice Judaism in, in order to be recognized as a Jew. In Israel, it's enough to uh, practice Israelism um, or not. Putting it on the floor. Thank you very much again. Uh, 
I would like to answer to this. Uh, it is not exactly, uh, it is not true that the photograph in diaspora show Jews performing Judaism in many different ways. Uh, it is true that in the communities that I have approached, which belong to what I would call the ethnographic uh, part of my journey, whether in the island of Jerba, in India, in Yemen, Jews were basically practicing Judaism, like when you go to bed, you wash your teeth. And this was a breathing, this was, but, and I was myself confronted to when there's not anymore, what happens when there's no more signs of your identity, when you experience your identity without any practice, which is the case of, let's say, Chateau Rabat, the photograph of those former uh, Maranos who uh, basically went to Bordeaux, but it's the case, all the series I made on America, there's hardly any photograph uh, about, uh, you know, Jews going to synagogue. There's hardly True. any, the group, the group which interest me, interested me were the Aquarius Minyan in San Francisco, or people who were reinventing Judaism in an interesting way, going back to, you know, the center and the margin. So, but, uh, but I was myself wrestling when, for example, I went to former Soviet Union. The photograph you saw of former Soviet Union in Birobidjan have no signs of Judaism. Now, it was very interesting when I was, <laughs> I was in Birobidjan for many months. On the 1st of May, this man, this man, Alexei Polonsky, told me, Agito Yonto <laughs> on the 1st of May. So you see the process of acculturation and that, but so how, once those signs have disappeared, how do you show, uh, how do you show this identity? So I have been, I have, I have asked myself these, these questions. As for Israel, uh, I did show some people who are, the truth is that because I, I, I publish, I mean, my first monograph was about Mea Shearim, I say I will not absolutely not go back and not make any photograph which shows, you know, neo-Hasidic practice, let's put it like that. And I was invited at a dinner to some uh, friends of my wife, some no, my wife uh, was the chief curator of the Jewish Museum in Amsterdam, and some people gave and uh, came and uh, met with her, and they invited her uh, for a Shabbat dinner. And when I, when I entered this room, I couldn't resist. I mean, it, it took me three or four months to convince them to make this photograph. And it's very interesting that in a way, when the exhibition took place in New York, this is one of the few photographs which, uh, you know, even it went to Basel for the art fair and that, and people bought it on the spot. You know, it was, there's no more edition of this photograph other than other photographs, which photographically as are important, but no, this kind of uh, iconic, uh, frozen, uh, almost a fetish representation of the Jew. So, but you see also, in the the man Fatitor and his wife in the in Midbar Yehuda, you know, uh, settler, it's also a practicing uh, Judaism, not practicing Israeliness in a way. It's a, but but to say just that I am uh, I am aware and I have been dealing and sometimes wrestling with these issues. But thank you for your comment. The facts. Um, I don't have any clear thing to say. Uh, I just, I, oh, I, first of all, I wanted to say that it was amazing and very, very interesting for me. And I'm very uh, busy with the uh, figure of a Jew as aesthetic category and you know the ways that uh, Jews can think about themselves. Um, but it was very interesting to think about um, 
it's like it's a project of represent uh, representing and question of representing and you could see in each uh, picture how um, how you can uh, I don't know what to say how you can uh, take uh, some uh, signs and to clot it and to um, so it was very interesting, but I also you could see very clear how um, how the Jew is is really a keilot medumianot. Imagine a community. Absolutely. And you can see also the fellows that there is nothing that really connects them. And I, I thought about uh, if uh, you could you could put uh, another community, and we couldn't say anything about it. And it was also very interesting for me. Yeah, so thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Yes, you know, when and I, you know, I use few times the Jewish people. <laughs> this is like, of course, it's totally obsolete. What is this people? What is or when we say the Jewish people, uh, there's an idea of Shlemut, there's an idea of, you know, I've been questioning what these people is about and I keep questioning it. So it's not an assertion. At, uh, at any point. <laughs> Anyone else? So I, I, I hope there are other people asking uh, ready for questions. Um, for indiscreet Odette? questions. Odette, were you, were you raising your hand? No? Okay. So I, I'd like to ask Frederick, um, you know, we said nothing uh, that we can act, point at clearly connects all those people, and yet they all identified as Jewish before you, right? I mean, you were speaking to them. Did you ask them what? Did did, did you ask them to talk about their identity, and uh, explain in what way you did not? I mean, when you go to Yemen. And you don't have people are living this identity, whatever this identity means for them. They are not, they, they, are, they are not, I mean, just imagine in the 80s. Today, I may have asked them some questions, but today they don't exist anymore where they existed. So they were just breathing, they were living their identity uh, by, you know, observing whatever they thought was enable them to, you know, uh, uh, so those traditional communities where this was this their identity was through their through their practice. Now, what what made the identity of a Jew in uh, in Birobidjan? Uh, or in Rome? That, or... Uh, or in Rome? Or in Rome, it was very clear the community is a very compact community, quite traditional. Whether they are, you know, they are not necessarily Shomer Shabbat. You have some people who are Shomer Shabbat, but uh, but a very, I mean, this is again the very place where, as I say, Christianism was manufactured uh, and exported, and they were kept, you know, in the ghetto until, you know, eighteen. Uh, until 1850, I think. So, uh, and in a way, the ghetto is still in them. And uh, so they were very, very strongly, um, very strongly identifying to, uh, to their, you know, their identity. Um, would, would you say it's historical memory? Sorry? The calendar, I mean, we usually think of the calendar, right, as uniting Jews or historical, yes. or historical memory. I'd like to ask yes, if I'll... Yes, historical memory and yes, and uh, the calendar, I'm trying to think of. And then, you know, I spent uh, three years in the former in, uh, uh, in uh, North America. So then you have a very interesting Judaism a la carte. And, uh, you know, no, no other communities, not even during the Hellenistic period, reinvented themselves like, like America. It was for me an extraordinary journey. It's now almost, you know, 
30 years ago that I did this work, but uh, it was a very important, it was a very important uh, uh, journey for me, America. And then people identify through so many different means. Uh, definitely, this is, I mean, of course, the identification in America uh, had to do a lot with Israel. Of course, the, the, the definition of our identity in diaspora as Jews in diaspora is today very connected to Israel. Is it Whether, still? Is absolutely. It still? I mean, is. it is still either in a negative way or in a positive way, but 30 years ago, it was still. I mean, between 30 years ago and today, a lot of things have changed. But in America, I mean, really one of the cornerstone of American identity, uh, of American Jewish identity has been Israel and the identification to Israel. Undoubtedly. And this leads me to my next question, but Peter has would like to speak, right? Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Listening to the words, I met some of your books and you always gave the, the, the task to talk or to make an introduction to other persons. It was very interesting to hearing you uh, in your own voice. And for me, it's interesting the question, if you met colleagues, colleague photographers that were looking for the French, which is a diaspora in France, and going out with a center like Paris for French identity, but there are very many local cultures. If you have been in America, you know that the American identity as a nation, national identity is, is very interesting in its diversity, in its diasporas of American uh, forms of life. And so this is the question for me, if you met somebody with the same kind of energies looking up for diversity for the, you came back in your opening words to the identity to the unity of the person and the person the per, personal perspective and the personal standing so you used you came back very much to a concept of that the person is you in, in, in his different views in different direction is uh, is is the true testimony of this diversity but again, do you meet some colleagues or photographers that were coming up to a similar approach that looking for diversity is, is opening an inner diversity, a personal diversity or something like this? I, thank you for your question. No, I have not met people. I mean, I've met uh, quite a number of my colleagues. The last project that I uh, initiated and conducted here in Israel, you know, I brought 11 uh, artists who have really reinvented and shaped what modern photography is today. Uh, people like Jeff Wall, people like Stephen Shore, Joseph Kudelga and that. But I would say that uh, listening to what I call the polyphony within, to be in touch with this overflow of self, within myself uh, to be, which, you know, you have Gurdjieff speaks a lot about that. And I've been very, in my very early years, uh, also very influenced by Gurdjieff. But uh, uh, this, this notion of polyphony within uh, is for me key. And it's something that I, I was not, you know, I was born to by discovering this. I mean, the, I would speak also of we, each of us is a multiplicity and a multiplicity articulated to many other multiplicity. And, you know, Gilles Deleuze say, life, la vie n'est pas personnelle. Life is not personal. And it's a very today, I mean, he thought of that 30 years ago when we see where individualism is leading us and when you see this over fragmentation. So for me, this polyphony and what when I launched the project here in Israel, 
my goal was to invite people to really look within in order not to instrumentalize Israel and to, to listen to the polyphony within in order to be able to, in order to be able to dare not to understand Israel. It's not about understanding, it's about not understanding. I believe that, I believe that we are known, we are understood. I believe that there's a will which wants us much bigger than our own will. So this is for the polyphony, but I have not met uh, a photographer and not, not in France who has who wanted to look uh, who, who had this idea of uh, uh, multiplicity, polyphony within, uh, but I, I was only brought to, to acknowledge this polyphony within by looking at all these fragments that I was brought to encounter and to, to portray. So then it brought me back to what I call an inner geography of my many selves. Just uh, one short note, I would be like, be, be a fly on the wall when you were speaking with Alex Liebach. Ah. Because he is able, he is able to define Israel, Israelism or is, uh, Israeliness in a kind of not def uh, defining, like you choose in your Berlin uh, exhibition, not to put w too much words, that uh -huh. taking the, uh, the task of the viewer. I know, so, but I know Alex, and I should call him, and I will. Uh, I could exchange with Alex. <laughs> thank you, thank you for for your remarks. Uh, Frederick, before we part, I'd like to raise once more, perhaps, the um, question pertaining to our choice of uh, our, our annual theme, the center and periphery. Do you find it at all fruitful or? helpful in in your work to think of center and peripheries or there is no such thing no no absolutely i have basically whenever i dealt with any given place or community i really never dealt with communities i dealt with the fringes because the fringes define the center or keep redefining the center and today it's more true than ever I mean, it was always true, but today it is even more true than ever. So I very often dealt with the margin. I dealt with the center, but I dealt with the margin as the, uh, as um, in a way you could foresee where, where this society was heading to or where this community. So I was always, I was always interested in the margin to understand better the center, but I did never ignore the center. Right. I cannot believe that there's no other questions among the, the participants. Indiscreet questions. <laughs> Maybe they're shy. <laughs> no, no, you should not be shy. I mean, I... Uh, I like to ask about that discontinuity. Sorry. Discontinuity. Uh, this this yes. You. So, so can you talk about the Jewish people, or there's no such uh, such thing because such thing because every community, every person defines himself in his own way, in his own terms. So. There's nothing in common. Yeah, I mean, again, I mean, uh, this has also been for me a journey. You know, I uh, imagine I started, I was 18. Uh, I was in Mea Shearim. And for me, that was the authentic Jew. And I was really fascinated. I went to, I went to Montreal. I went to New York. New York and I photograph and I thought I would photograph uh, Jews everywhere, but those were the Jews. And slowly, slowly, I was brought again, I, as I say, and it's not a way of speaking, I mean, this journey undertook me, 
you know, all was what, all what had remained unspoken, dissimulated, buried within my ultra assimilated family who came back to Judaism, uh, you know, after the, the, the six days war and that. And, uh, and so slowly, slowly, my spectrum expanded. And that's why when I say the Jewish people, I should not even use this, this, uh, <laughs> this word, because what is the Jewish people? It's a question. Uh, I mean, it is, I mean, my, through my work, I was, uh, I was born to paradox, ambivalence, and discontinuity. And, uh, and today, we cannot ignore Yes, you can always ignore, but it's very hard to ignore paradox and ambivalence and uh, because it's what is prevailing today. And we live in an extraordinary time, I mean, of uh, a time of unsettled identities where we can question those fictions that we have hold on to and that we have hammered. Uh, and uh, um, so, so, Yes, I mean, I, and, and I'm very interested to, to start revisiting what I did for 40 years, uh, because outside, out of this, what you saw are really small fragments out of, as I say, you know, 150,000 images, and to be able to revisit this, uh, this work, because you photograph not with your mind, or your or your heart, you photograph with your belly, you photograph with your kishkes. So, and to discover many things and create out of this uh, photographic harvest an archive, and to in a way enable. Uh, ideally, I want to enable people to undertake their own journey of self exploration through my through my own journey, but because my own journey. Uh, goes in all so many directions and there are all so many questions. So once we have digitized the photograph and cataloged the photograph, by the way, I just take advantage of this event. I didn't think of that, but now if we are basically looking for uh, catalogers and people who have done field work because 60% of the group that I photograph live today in Israel, uh, people who would be interested in taking part in this uh, journey uh, of interviewing people uh, that you see, for example, on some of the photographs or cataloging. Uh, so we are now in the process of uh, basically interviewing uh, people for, for these, uh, these work. <laughs> so if you know yourself or around, I would be very uh very grateful uh daniela you can uh, pass on my email okay uh, i will keep yeah. it in my, we will keep it in mind yeah i think and at I... an early stage i think uh six months ago when you contacted me i think i may have asked you oh would you know by any chance uh, uh people who would be interested in in taking part in that maybe you know some people are more specialized in Central Asia or, or interested because of their research. So this is a question that I'm, uh, I'm asking now. I'm, I'm sure we, some of our students would, would like to engage in such a project. Um, we will keep this and as- so the, Sorry. Okay. No, I, I wanted to say that our, actually our time is up. And I wanted to uh, thank you very, very much. And also refer people to your website, right? There, there, there's more. My to website is my website is very poor. It's an old website. And as we are going to, you know, start creating this archive with the National Library, uh, but uh, but they are, you know, the books and that. I mean, you can go on the website, but uh, and you can still see, uh, see more. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And you can go on the site of the Jewish Museum in Berlin if you want to have an idea of uh, the exhibition, which is finishing tomorrow. But it's on the website, and there were several artist talk, and uh, it will be subtitled soon. And there was an artist talk that I did uh, a month ago, which is in English. So, yes. And uh, thank you very much for. Great. For thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
שבוע טוב. להתראות. להתראות. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ciao.